All right, now before we look at some general themes in Hebrews, I want to talk a little bit here about the first project sermon that's coming due on week three. And I'm going to do this today, seeing that I'm going to be gone a few days next week. Now also in that connection, uh, you have your first content quiz scheduled uh, for next week uh, over the first nine chapters uh, of Hebrews. And I want that to be taken, all right, um, by the end of the week. Not on Monday because we'll have class uh, on Monday, but sometime before the end of the week, uh, I want you to take the content quiz. Uh, I'll give them to Charlie and just pick them up from him and take them before I get back. Now, just over nine chapters, and I trust this is not the first time in your Christian career uh, that you've read the book of Hebrews, uh, so there should be some very familiar, uh, some very familiar uh, things there and not that large of a uh, corpus. I'll ask very specific things, uh, and you will simply identify the chapter. So maybe something like what chapter, the anchor of hope. We have an anchor, right? Everybody knows that's chapter six, right? So that kind of thing. Uh, where is Christ superior to Moses? Um, chapter three, all right? So that that kind of specific thing, and you identify the chapter. So just get a familiarity with there, and we'll see how it goes. So by the end of next week, that will be taken. Now your first sermon, your first sermon, we're doing three different types of sermons. And as I indicated in our opening uh, discussion, all of these are biblical, all right? I, I don't like the idea that there are some types of sermons that are more biblical uh, than others. I grant you that there are some preachers that are less biblical than others, but uh, let's not blame the sermon methodology. Uh, we're doing first a topical sermon, and uh, then a textual sermon, and then an expository sermon. Uh, you're going to find ultimately what your niche is, you're going to feel more comfortable with uh, one type or another, but here in your education we want to expose you to uh, the different uh, methodologies. Uh, there are some that I feel more comfortable with. Uh, I, I tend to uh, lean toward expository, taking a single passage. Um, I do topical uh, from time to time. It'd be a long time before I could remember the last time I did a textual sermon. I find textual sermons to be the most difficult, um, and I very seldom preach that way. But uh, you're going to find what your niche uh, is going to be, but we're going to expose you to uh, the various types. And they all, if done properly, uh, are biblically sound and theologically sound, and all involve an equal amount of exposition. All right? Exposition is simply taking the data from your exegesis, exegesis, you know the difference, right, between, uh, between exegesis and exposition. Exegesis is just collecting the data, all right, that's looking at your grammar, that's looking at your uh, context, that's looking at your theology, whatever, but particularly it's just collecting the data in the interpretation of that text. You can have an exegetical outline. An exegetical outline of a passage does not constitute a sermon. And I think that's what sometimes gives expository preaching a bad name, is that some will give me an exegetical outline of the text and call that expository preaching. It's not. Uh, something that I might do in just teaching the content of a class or a content of a book in a class uh, does not constitute uh, exposition. Exposition is taking the data of that exegesis uh, and then developing the significance, the relevance of that, the universality of that, uh, in a way where we're going to be able to preach uh, to the text. So in an exegetical outline of, you know, the story of Balaam, for instance. You know, Balaam did this, Balaam did that, Balaam did something else. Uh, that's a nice exegetical outline. But I wouldn't preach that. 
All right? I would not preach that way unless I was confident that I had a congregation full of Balaams, uh, all by that name. All right? Because as soon as I put the outline, Israel did this, or Paul did that, or where's the relevance? It becomes a book report. All right? There's a difference between a sermon and a book report. Uh, an exegetical outline, if you will, is simply a book report about that passage. Exposition now is taking that and establishing and identifying what the universal truths are. So here's the, you know, here's the data, the exegetical data. From that, we extract the truths, the universal, timeless uh, truths, and then we are going to seek to apply that to uh, our new setting, people that we're preaching to. Uh, how is that going to be uh, made relevant? Now, I don't care what type of sermon you're doing then, whether it's a textual or a topical or a, a passage, what I call the expository type of preaching. Uh, that process is, uh, is uh, always operating. Right? I, I think why I like uh, expository preaching, uh, you know, in, in one sense, it's, you know, I'm lazy. Uh, and uh, it limits my work to a given passage. All right. Instead of having to do this contextually to a number of passages, uh, which, if we're going to do it right, must be done, uh, we're just limiting our investigation to that one particular pericope. All right, so exegesis, you're going to do whatever the passage, whatever the type of sermon is. Now, the first one is uh, going to be a topical sermon, and I'm suggesting... Uh, the theme for you here to be developed from the occurrences of proserchomai uh, in the book of Hebrews. All right, proserchomai is occurring, I think, seven times uh, in the book. So I want you to find out where those references are uh, in Hebrews. Here's where our exegesis is going to uh, factor in. Uh, look at each of those passages. You look at each of those passages in which proserchomai occurs. Uh, what is it teaching? What are the truths? What's the data that I'm going to collect uh, from each of those uh, each of those texts? Now the theme is going to be obviously related to the meaning of this word. Proserchomai means what? To come to. All right, to come to. It's going to be translated differently in your English Bible. Sometimes to come to, sometimes to approach, perhaps. Uh, but what does it mean to come to? Uh, what are the context of this coming? Where are we coming? You know, there are certain there are certain things, I don't want to give a sermon away here, but I just thought of a nice sermon. Uh, you know, wh where, where do we come? You know, are, are, are there some texts that identify the where of the coming? Uh, who comes? How do you come? Uh, why do you come? That's pretty good. And, and I, I, I could work those out perhaps into a, uh, in, into a, uh, topic that we would want to develop, but the idea of somehow is coming, coming to God, coming to the heaven, coming not coming. Sometimes it's negative. All right, I think in Hebrews 12 there we we don't come to Sinai, uh, but we come to Zion. Uh, so what, what's what's that teaching? All right, so look at these various references uh, in the book of Hebrews where the word proserchomai occurs, and collect your data. All right, you collect uh, your data. Now, in a topical sermon, in a topical sermon, once we come to the text, and here the text is constituted here with this word where it occurs, uh, we are going to develop uh, the theme, theme slash topic. And that, that's what it's about. You know, what, what am I talking about here? Well, obviously, in Prosurka, we're going to be talking about coming. Coming where, coming who comes, and or however you want to. Uh, develop that particular uh, that particular theme. Now, in a topical sermon, uh, from the text or texts here that we are choosing, we get the theme, we get the topic. All right? uh, the development is going to come then from the whole corpus of scriptural data. There are times when I may want to limit it, uh, but I would set that limitation up in the uh, introduction, perhaps. But at least you're free to incorporate uh, data from other passages of Scripture to develop that particular topic. All right, now then, 
here's how we're going to develop this. For each of the sermons, and so what I'm going to say here in terms of the structure uh, is going to apply to the next two sermons uh, as well, all right, as far as the basic structure is concerned. How we structure it will depend upon the type of the sermon. I'm looking here for four pages. I'm looking for four pages. Now I say, I'm not going to listen to you preach this. I don't know what kind of notes you like to take into the pulpit with you. Maybe you're just, again, trying to find out what you're most comfortable with. Uh, some people like to manuscript their sermons, uh, write everything out word for word. That would put me in bondage. Uh, but, you know, I, I know some very good preachers that do that. Um, some simply like to uh, put an acrostic in the palm of their hand so that when they gesture they see what their next point is. Uh, and, and that's all uh, that they're going to take in the pulpit. Well, obviously, I don't want the palm of your hand. All right, You can't turn that into me. And I don't want a manuscript. But what I want here, and I think if we do what I'm asking you to do, uh, I'm going to see enough of what your thinking process is. I'm going to see enough of your structure so that I can tell where you're going, how you're accomplishing it. This may not be what you're comfortable taking into the pulpit, all right? So don't look at it from that uh, from that standpoint. But I want you to approach it as though uh, as though you would and could preach this. Uh, over the years, you know, I, I've had students do uh, sermons for me, and I look at those sermons that they give to me, and I bring them to my office, and I question their call to the ministry. Uh, if this is all you can do, then you know I, I think you're in the wrong business. And I've had responses, well, you know, I, I wouldn't preach that way. That, that's just what I'm giving to you. Right? Well, uh, I, I'm glad you wouldn't preach that way, but I don't want to see it either. Uh, I want this to be something that you would actually preach, although the actual document that you turn into me may not be what you would feel comfortable with uh, in the pulpit. Uh, I'm going to ask for some things here so that there'll be enough enough data uh, that I will be able to ascertain what the sermon is about and where where it's going. All right, so first of all, we're going to have an introduction. Now, I want the introduction manuscript. All right, I want the introduction manuscript, uh, word for word. Half page, somewhere between one half and three-quarter of a page, single space. And for those of you that are taking this online and heard that strange sound uh, in the background, a chew, a chew, one of the students was just sneezing. All right, one of the students was just sneezing. So I'm explaining what that extraneous sound may have been uh, that you heard. Um, it wasn't me. Now, in the introduction, all right, half page, three quarters of a page, single space. I don't care what you do here. All right, the purpose of the introduction is to establish the need. All right, from the introduction, I want to know why you're preaching this message. I want to know what this message is about. All right, so somewhere in the introduction, I have to be able to identify what that theme is, what the topic is, what are we talking about, what is the relevance of this, why should I be listening to you? All right, why should I be listening to you about this? Uh, establish the need, establish what the uh, topic, uh, what the topic uh, is. Now, I, I think the introduction is important. That's why I'm having you manuscripted here. Uh, if, if you don't, in a sense, nail it in the introduction, uh, as far as establishing that need, as far as uh, making it clear to the people what it is you want them to be doing for the next little while uh, as they listen to you. You know, why should they be listening to you? All right, why should they be listening to you? In the introduction, you're making it clear uh, why. All right, what is the need uh, and what is the topic? And by the time we come to that introduction, remember your freshman English? Remember your freshman English in your introduction? You have this inverted funnel thing here. Uh, as, as you're narrowing it down. So by the time I come to the end of this introduction, by the time I come to the end of the introduction, I want to know unmistakably what your topic, what your theme is, and what your proposition is. 
Now, again, I'm not certain what the terminology is that Mr. Wagner uses here uh, for what I'm talking about, so he may use different terminology. This is what I refer to it uh, myself. The topic, the topic is what it's about. All right, the theme, what is it about? The proposition now is our statement of relevance. What is the proposition that I'm trying to prove? What's the proposition that I'm trying to develop? What is the major application thrust, perhaps, uh, that uh, we are trying to accomplish? All right, so the topic, theme, and the proposition, sometime by the time I come to the end of that introduction, I want to know what the sermon is about and why I need to be listening to this sermon. What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, that's the proposition. That's the proposition. So somewhere I say between a half and three uh, fourths of a page, single space uh, for the introduction. All right, so we have the introduction. The rest of the sermon now will be outlined for me. And I want to take this at least, all right, I want the outline development to be at least uh, to two levels. I can go beyond that in certain points if you like, but at least uh, for two levels. Now in the level one points, the level one points, however many you have, whatever. What are the level one points doing? The level one points are proving, they are developing your theme, topic, proposition. All right. So when I come to the statement that I have here in the first level one point, I don't want to be surprised. All right? I don't want to read that introduction. All of a sudden, you know, here's my first point, and I'm scratching my head. What does that have to do with what I've just read or what I've just heard? You see? Uh, the level one statements are proving, they are developing, they are arguing, whatever, your theme, proposition. So there are four things about this topic, four things about this proposition that I want to say. Here they are. Here they are. Now, the outline, n n nothing you know, sacred about an outline, except it's a tool. All right? It's a tool that we can use to help our own thinking, but to help the people follow uh, our train of thought. Uh, so it's just a nice device here, pragmatic device that we're going to use to help the people understand and follow and get the point of what it is we're trying to get across. So each of the level one statements are developing the proposition. Point number two here, this is still level one, or you understand what I mean by level one points. Point two here is not a development of point one, it's a development of our proposition. All right, so each of these are going back to the proposition. It's not that here's my first statement, now let me comment on that, that for number, no. Each of the level one statements are developing the proposition. Now, we need to structure them, and again, this is just a pragmatic device aiding in the uh, memory and the ability for our people to listen to our preaching. I want those level one statements to be structured in a parallel fashion. All right, Structure them in a parallel fashion. If I use a sentence, a short brief sentence, maybe. I'm not opposed to that. I do it very often. Then I want the same kind of structure in the second point, in the same kind of structure in the third point. If I begin point one with the infinitive for some reason, I don't want to begin point two with a gerund. You see. I want to keep the same grammatical structure uh, to keep the points parallel so that again we can easily see the development of that message as we are going through it, not only for our own sakes, but particularly for the sake of those that we uh, want uh, to follow what we are saying, those that we're preaching to. So I'll, I'll be looking for a parallel structure. When I grade the papers, 
All right, when I grade the papers, here's, here's my process. Here's my process. I will read your introduction, and then I will, before I do anything else, look at your level one statements. All right? And I will make a comment, if necessary, that the points are not structured parallel one with the other. I will make a statement, if necessary, that I don't see the logic of what, the, or what they are doing in regard to that proposition. All right, so before I read anything else, there's something in those points that ought to communicate the progression of thought in how I'm proving or arguing for my theme proposition. Okay, you with me there? The level one statements developing the proposition. Now, my guess is that each of those are going to be based upon some aspect of what you're seeing with Prasurkamai. All right, that's the whole uh, theme that we're seeing here. All right, now, level two points. That's the A's and the B's. All right, the level two statements. What are the level two statements developing? Level two statements are how now I'm developing <laughs> that principal level one statement. All right, so A is part of my argument in proving what I've said in point one. B is not a comment on A. B is another comment on the level one statement. And same thing here. All right, so the level twos are developing. How are we developing the points here established in the level one developments? And we ought to try to make these parallel in their structure as well. Okay? Now that's the outline. That's the outline. That's not going to be four pages. Introduction, half, three quarters of a page, and then the outline development. But we're going to fill in now some of the meat here uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the outline. Now as you uh, do this for me, it would be helpful. It would be helpful for my grading, and that's always to your advantage to keep me in a good mood while I'm grading. Uh, in, in those level one points, put them in bold. You are using computer. Put those in bold. All right, that will just help me find them quickly uh, on the on the page when I'm looking for them. All right, now that's the outline. The outline is the bones. That's the skeleton that we are going to be using to develop the progression here of our theme topic. Now. In a textual sermon, the level one points come from the text. The level two points can come from anywhere. In an expository sermon, every point comes and is developed from the text that is chosen. Okay. In this sermon, the topical sermon, topic defined by Prosercomai, there's our topic, and now theoretically, uh, the even the statements that we have here can be from other passages, but I'm suggesting that you allow what is being said here to be dictated by what the Prosercomai statements are in Hebrews. All right, now, here's where the uh, meat, how we're going to put in the meat of the sermon. At whatever point, you know, you, you, you give me a scripture reference. You're going to put in parentheses the word explanation, and then you are going to, in single space, give me enough explanation of that text. Here's your explanation involving your exposition as well, whatever. I want to see enough of the explanation of that text that justifies the statement that you've just made. All right, so I'm making this statement. Now, why am I making that statement? Here's the scripture that I would comment on. Whatever my comments would be, and again, I'm not looking for these explanations here to be in manuscript form. It may not necessarily be exactly how you would say it, but I want enough of the data there so that it becomes clear to me how you are using and what you are saying about that given, about that given text. So for text explanation, we'll do it this way. Not manuscripted, but just, you know, a few lines of explanation. 
I don't want to see, you know, I, I don't want to see here a lot of technical stuff. I want to see the evidence of the technical stuff. All right, I, I don't want you to start giving me genitive uses uh, at this point. I, 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 I want to see how you would take a genitive use or a participle use or some of the grammatical data and make the point for the people that you are preaching to. I want to see how you can translate that. I'm not going to get up there and preach and tell my people this is a blank kind of genitive. Now let's go to the next point. All right. I'm going to give them the evidence. What, what are the implications of that? And That's what I want you to be able to see here. Can you take the text? Can you take your grammar? Can you take your uh, exegetical data and communicate it in a way uh, that is understandable to the people that you're preaching to? I will be able to tell. All right, when I read that explanation, I will be able to tell, okay, he's seeing that as this kind of participle or that kind of infinitive or that kind of genitive or whatever. You see. But not manuscripted. I'm not looking for the classy and the flowery uh, language necessarily, but just enough of the explanation as to how you are using that text. At whatever point in the sermon, there will be application. We'll do it the same way. Put in parentheses the word application. And then you will spell out in single space enough of the application where, again, it's clear that I know what you're trying to accomplish here. Again, not necessarily in the words that you would use in expressing it as preaching, but explain to me what the significance by the application, what, what is the, you know, what's the so what of this? What do you want the people to do or not do or to feel or not feel or what, whatever? See, give me the specific application uh, that would be made. And this could occur at, you know, at, at any point. And then when there is an illustration, any illustration that you use, same thing, put in parentheses, word illustration, and then spell out enough of the illustration where I know what it is you're illustrating and how it fits. Now, all of these are necessary. It may not be that every point has every one of those. But throughout, wherever appropriate, I want to see the explanation of the text, a statement generally of the application of the text, and a summation of the illustration that is being used. And, you know, be imaginative in the illustrations. I like biblical illustrations. You know, if you're hung up on Knights 101 or 1001 and you don't want to talk about those nifty little stories. Yeah, I'm not too impressed with that. But, um, but some analogy, some you know il illustration from a, a, a biblical uh, scenario context that would help get the picture. The illustrations are giving pictures of what it is we're trying to get across. All right, now if you do that at wherever necessary, if you do this wherever necessary, you know, this may be five, six lines, a couple, four lines, you incorporate those at every point where they are uh, appropriate in the outline. We ought to be able to do this in about four pages. And if I see that, all right, if I see that, that will tell me enough, even though I'm not hearing you preach it, where I will be able to know where you're going, what you're trying to accomplish, all right? And I can evaluate it then on that basis. When it comes to the conclusion, I'm not having to do anything with the conclusion. All right, my view of the conclusion is that if you identify in the introduction what it is you're going to do, and you do it in the uh, body of the sermon, if you fulfill that logically in the body of the sermon, conclusion can only be one thing. All right, so I can pretty much guess what your conclusion. Uh, is going to be. So don't worry about trying to do anything at that level. Okay, that's clear to me. Any questions, what I'm after? All right, so you begin uh, working on this. This is coming due in the third week, and this is one of the things that you can be working on when I'm gone next week. All right, so not vacation time. This is... Uh, time to get started both on the content quiz and on this first on this first message okay
Any questions? Very good. All right, now we come to Book of Hebrews. Made some very general comments yesterday concerning the issues of authorship and what have you, and a lot of that we develop more thoroughly in the introduction classes. Today I want to begin looking at the the message of the book. I don't know how much time we're going to have to go through every single uh, chapter uh, in the book. I'll try to hit some of the highlights, certainly. But I thought I would begin by just isolating some of the key theological themes uh, that occur uh, in the book it will help us to get an overview of what the book is about and how the argument of that book is progressing. Now we did identify yesterday what is very much on the surface the principal uh, theme of the book which concerns the superiority uh, of Jesus Christ. He's better than everything. He's better than everything. And the author gives a significant comparison of Christ uh, with many, many things to demonstrate that superiority. Now, the purpose of that, so, you know, here, here, here's, you know, in essence, something we learn from, you know, from the sermon here. As I said yesterday, I think the, the, uh, the, the basic structure, the basic uh, genre of Hebrews is more sermonic than anything else. That's why I am not too impressed with the stylistic arguments denying or trying to prove someone else's argument, or authorship, rather. Uh, it's a sermon. It's the only thing like this that we have in the, uh, in, in the Scripture. Uh, it's a unique genre. But as a sermon, all right, as a sermon, here's the topic. I said a moment ago, I want the topic, and then I want the proposition. Uh, so the primary topic of the book of Hebrews would be the superiority of Christ. All right? That's what it's about the absolute superiority of Christ uh, in every conceivable way. Now, what's the proposition? All right. what, what, what's the purpose of this book? In introduction, even, uh, when we look at these individual books, we make a distinction between the theme of the book and the purpose of the book. The theme, what's it about? The purpose, why was it written? Or there's a sense, our, our proposition. What's the so what of the superiority of Christ? Well, uh, far and away, uh, the principal focus here, as we see in all of these exhortation passages, and these warning passages, and we'll develop those here in due course, uh, because Christ is who he is, because of that absolute supremacy of Jesus Christ, you better not, you better not forsake him. You better not renege upon that commitment to him. You better not Go back, you better not. So here is this exhortation to faithfulness. It's an exhortation to faithfulness in the midst of this potential apostasy. Now, having said that, uh, I think there are some very important uh, themes that are developed, theological points, if you will, that uh, are developed all the way through the book. So let me just highlight, I'm not going to develop these in great uh, detail at this point, because hopefully we can come back and look at the exposition of some of these chapters uh, as we come to them. But what does this book teach us about God? It has much to say about Jesus Christ as the mediator, and particularly uh, in his priestly mediation. Uh, but what does the book reveal to us about God? There's obviously a great focus on God's greatness, on God's holiness, Come to chapter 12 there, and you see the connection there to Sinai uh, and what that revealed concerning the transcendence of God and the majesty of God and the holiness of God. You dare not come to that mountain lest they, uh, lest they perished. So we get this idea that God is uh, certainly great and, uh, and holy. He's the living God. He's the active God. But two things particularly. Uh, when, when, when I look at the data here concerning God. I think the book emphasizes particularly on the one hand uh, the justice of God, that God is just, and God is gracious. 
I think these two truths particularly uh, are brought to focus and it demonstrates then the absolute need and the grace of God in fulfilling that need in regard to the coming of Christ. Now he's the judge. All right, God is the judge. You have expressed statements of that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. God the judge, when we come, here's this general assembly to which we are ultimately going to come as we come to Mount Sinai, or to Mount Zion rather. We come to God, the judge of all. Very direct, very specific statement. The fact that he is the judge and the fact of that eternal judgment is absolute foundational truth. Interesting that in chapter 6, that uh, knows its own little bit of controversy that we'll address in due course. Remember how that chapter begins with uh, the author saying that we're leaving on these principles uh, to go on to other things, and he talks about these foundational truths. There's a list of foundational truths there. And in verse number 2, one of the foundational truths, eternal judgment, eternal judgment, the fact of judgment is absolutely certain. You know the classic text in chapter 9. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after that, the judgment. God is the judge. Fact of judgment, an essential truth. And the certainty of that judgment. As much as we have life, as much as we know the certainty of death, there is the certainty of that judgment. And we have examples of that have examples of that, the urgency, therefore, uh, of that. Uh, examples from Esau, examples from the wilderness generation that were under the judgment of God because of their transgressions. And the great uh, need, therefore, our recognition of accountability. In chapter 10, the classic text there, vengeance belongs to the Lord. I'll recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of that living God. So the fact of justice and the fact particularly that God is the judge. And so therefore, again, that's not just some abstract truth. That's not just some perfection of God or aspect of his work that we are cognizant of, but it ought to have a direct bearing upon the way we live. Fearful thing to know that we are accountable and that God does not, uh, well, is not ignorant of anything. All things are open, right? All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And we have to do with him. Every man has to do with him. It's a fearful thing. And so uh, that great emphasis, I say, upon God is justice in the fact that he is the judge. But a special focus on his grace as well. And uh, some classic text again that uh, we have in this book that remind us of the grace of God, uh, particularly as it relates to the sing sending uh, of Christ. We see Jesus, that God sent, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Uh, we, through Christ, are able to approach that throne of grace. And how amazing that is, that through the ministry of Christ and through the work of Christ, that throne of judgment is for us a throne of grace. Uh, great focus on the grace of of God. And in that connection, uh, really an important subset of that grace or manifestation of that grace is the great emphasis upon the promise of God. Uh, and the whole aspect of our salvation being part of that divine promise. This is one of the uh, great words. You know this word? Epongelia. You should know it if you're listening to me. It's the word promise, right? Uh, 
occurs in the book of Hebrews more frequently than any other one book. Fourteen times. Fourteen times the noun form epangelia occurs, the verb form four more times, more frequently than anywhere else in the New Testament. An emphasis here, an attention that is being given to the promises of God. And because of that focus on the promise of God as it relates to the coming of Christ, as it relates to the salvation, uh, a great emphasis then upon the faithfulness of God to that promise. He is faithful. He is faithful to the promise. Uh, chapter, uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 15 and following. It's amazing to me, and we'll talk about this when we come to this chapter. You know, one, one of the sections that cause the most concern and people wrestling with this as to whether or not they're part of those that have fallen away. A passage that has been misinterpreted to create doubt is, I think, ironically, one of the greatest passages that deal with the issue of assurance. Uh, as it moves now to this great reference of the promise, drawing attention to the promise that God had given uh, to Abraham, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs the promise of the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things of which it is impossible for God to lie, we have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor. Ah, there's that text. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The, the promise. Here's this immutable promise of God uh, that brings us uh, to the reality of Christ. Uh, we are the heirs of that promise. Uh, the new covenant, the new covenant involving that better promise, chapter 8 and verse 6. This better covenant which was established upon better promises. Promise of eternal inheritance that we have. So the promise of God, and this promise theme is a means of exhortation, therefore, to loyalty and belief. We stress God's faithfulness and the ability of God to perform what he has said, but that puts the responsibility then on those that are saved by no merit of their own to respond in that loyalty, in that belief to what he has promised. So God, we see his justice, he's the judge, he's grace. But I say the primary focus is upon the superiority of Christ in various ways, and I want to isolate a few thoughts here concerning what are principal focal points concerning the ministry of Christ. Unquestionably, you can't read uh, the book of Hebrews without being taken with the emphasis that is placed upon the death of Christ as the means. The death of Christ as the means whereby God will save. The means, the grounds by which God has given the promise. The whole purpose of the incarnation. The whole purpose of the incarnation is summed up uh, in that reference to his death. There in chapter 2 verse 9 that we've already made reference to. Here's Jesus made lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. There's the purpose. For the suffering of death, entering humanity. Remember, again, that text in chapter 9, is appointed unto men once to die, and after that the judgment. And we learn there very obviously that death is a human thing. It is a human thing to die. It's a human thing to die. And if there is to be the atonement, if there is to be the propitiation, and all of that, uh, we will see developed in regard to necessity. The very purpose of the incarnation, the purpose of God becoming flesh, involving here the necessity of this death, the means by which he's going to save. And the necessity of that death is particularly illustrated in terms of, uh, in terms of the covenant. And we'll develop this in uh, greater detail. Uh, but you look at chapter uh, 9 of Hebrews particularly. Christ is the mediator uh, of the new covenant. That by means of death, 
This is verse 15. For the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament by which uh, they are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. So the necessity of death here is seen in terms of the diatheke. Now, interesting word here. Let me just digress here as we come to this. Word diatheke is the word in the Septuagint. We know what the Septuagint is, right? The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures. Diatheke is the principal word that translates bereath, the word for covenant, word for covenant. Now, let's just set this up here. When we talk about a covenant, a mutual agreement, all right, a covenant here is a mutual agreement, talking about bereath now. A mutual agreement between parties involving stipulations, involving commitments, involving promises, but a mutual agreement. Now in the Old Testament, and not just in the Old Testament, but really evidence of this in the ancient Near Eastern world, and I suppose part of reality. Uh, there were two kinds of covenants. There were two kinds of covenants. On the one hand, what we refer to as a parity covenant, a parity covenant. Parity covenant is between equals, right, on par with each other, parity. A parity covenant between equals. In a parity covenant, there can be bargaining. There can be give and take. There can be negotiations. There can be compromise. But in that entire process, they come to an agreement then that becomes mutually binding upon the parties. And we have examples of those parity covenants in the Old Testament, whether it was between uh, Philistines and Abraham, and then later Isaac, in regard to those wells, right? Uh, they, they came. They, no, that one's mine. That, oh, you can have that one. They came to an agreement. Right, came to a covenant, parity. The second type we refer to often as a suzerainty covenant. A suzerainty covenant is between a superior and an inferior. The suzerain is the king, he's the superior. In the suzerainty covenant, there's no bargaining, there's no negotiation, there's no give and take, there's no compromise. The superior sets the terms, defines the stipulations, makes certain commitments, but he does that from a monopluric perspective. He, the suzerain, does it all. Now, I say we have various types, those two types of covenant. So as a conquering king, you conquer land, that king would go in and, as the suzerain, establish a covenant with those people demanding certain things from them, taxes or tribute or whatever, in which he promises that he won't kill them or whatever. You see. Uh, he'll supply this for them or that for them. Suzerainty. All right, now, having said that, the term bereath in the Old Testament is used for both of these types of covenants. All right, the term bereath is used for both of those types of covenant. But when we look at the covenant between God and man, all right, when we look at that covenant between God and man, is it a parity covenant or is it a suzerainty covenant? Obviously suzerainty. 
All right? God doesn't negotiate with man. God doesn't compromise with man. God sets the terms. God makes the move. God initiates. God enters that covenant voluntarily and sovereignly. No negotiation. Now, saying that then to say this. In Greek, there were two words that had the idea of covenant. All right, two words that have the idea of covenant. On the one hand, diatheke, and on the other hand, suntheke. In Greek, however, in Greek, the term diatheke basically had the idea of a last will and testament. That kind of covenant, all right? You make your will, you make your testament, uh, and then when you die, that becomes effectual, all right? That becomes effectual. So I have, you know, I have a will. I have a will, and that when I die, what's to be done with my stuff, all right? Who gets my stuff? And there's still a blank in that will as to who gets my deer heads. All right, <laughs> no, nobody seems to want them. Uh, so if you want my deer heads, let me know, and I'll put you in my will. Uh, last will and testament. All right. Suntheke is the word in Greek that typically referred to a contract, to this agreement between individuals, this mutually binding agreement. But in Greek, however. The soon they K invariably involved a parity contract. All right. So here comes the Septuagint translators, and here's this word bereath. And it's God's covenant that he enters into with man. What word to use? In one sense, soon they K is more the word that would express the idea of a contract, if you will, a mutually binding agreement. But yet, it involves a parity idea, which had to be avoided. All right, so the translators of the Septuagint use the word diatheke to refer to the bereath, and they, in so doing, infused that word diatheke with a meaning that elsewhere had never ever been used in Greek. All right. So this word was biblicized, if you will. It was taken out of its secular context and given a theological meaning that those that did not know the theology would misunderstand. All right? If you read the Septuagint without knowing the theology of that and read the Deotheca, you, you would not see it. You would interpret it as the last will and testament and how it infused it with an un Greek meaning. All right, it infused it with an un-Greek meaning. And the only ones that would understand that were those that were voiced uh, in the jargon, if you will, of the scriptures. All right. Now, saying that to say this, I come to the New Testament. And when I come to the New Testament, I see the word diatheke used many, many times in regard to the covenant. In regard to the covenant. And most of the time in the New Testament, it parallels or reflects that Septuagint use of the term diatheke, covenant, not will, not testament, but a covenant. Most of the occurrences of the word in the New Testament would not be understood by a secular Greek reader unless he knew the background from the Septuagint because it has this un-Greek meaning. All right, very interesting develop on the power that the Septuagint, the power that the Bible had to give definition to words. All right? uh, and that's a whole different uh, discussion for now. Now, most of the time then, we come to diatheke in the New Testament, it is to be understood in the Hebrew sense of the bereath. With one possible exception. With one possible exception. And that's what we have here before us in Hebrews chapter 9. He's the mediator of the new 
Do you think, hey, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression, I don't have any problem seeing the principal use of the word covenant there. But verse 16, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. That particular reference seems to play more upon the traditional Greek sense of that word. But just an interesting linguistic development there. But at any rate, at any rate, it becomes clear here that the death of Christ is absolutely essential. It's not optional. It's not optional. Let me finish this one thought here and then we'll finish for the day. This necessity of the death is also seen in terms of the sacrifices. The distinction that is going to be made between the imperfect sacrifices of the old dispensation and the perfect sacrifice of Christ. Those things were but shadows. I want to develop that more and we will. Those things were just shadows of the reality. But what gives meaning to the shadow? And I think we sometimes get confused here in our interpretation of stuff. It is not the shadow that defines the reality. It's the reality that defines the shadow. The shadow has no existence apart from the reality. When you see a shadow, when you see your own shadow, you know, I mean, you, that's not you. But you ought to follow that shadow, you know, back to where, and, oh, there's me. Right. So always a substance that gives the shadow. It's the reality that gives definition to the shadow. Shadows are imperfect. Shadows are imperfect. Sometimes your shadow makes you look skinny. Sometimes it makes you look fat. Shadows are imperfect. And by design, all of those Old Testament sacrifices were by design imperfect. They were by design imperfect. And they knew it. They were but shadows pointing to the reality. But what those Old Testament sacrifices shadowed, we see the reality in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we have explicit statements that uh, he had to die. So the necessity of the death of Christ. Well, we'll talk next time about the priestly work of Christ, but uh, it'll, flow, uh, it'll flow from that. So I'm, I'm giving you some general theological themes here, uh, an overview of the book and then we'll come and look at some of the specifics. Okay.